So what I'd like to visit you with you today about is how to create a safe environment when you're handling manure. As we think about this, we need to ask ourselves why we should, be com should not be complacent. Well, as of 2016, we've had over 150 people die in manure gas exposures since 1960. Half of these occurrences have been on dairies, and 22% of those deaths involve the second person trying to rescue someone. So those are pretty staggering numbers. As being involved in agriculture, I've found you know, that I know too many people who have died as a result of a farm accident. And this one really hit home to me, and, and I actually grew up with the people, um, as you'll see on the slide here, Wayne and Josh Odegaard, grew up with the kids, was involved in 4-H with them through my younger life. When I came back to Kingsbury County, um, was personally involved with the parents, with Wayne Odegaard as a 4-H leader and his family, Sharon and the boys. And so I just want to read to you um, the report from this incident. And it says, February 10th, 2004, according to the Watertown Public Opinion, Kingsbury County authorities Monday released the cause of death in the weekend farm accident that claimed a father and son. Wayne Odegaard, 57, and his 28-year-old son, Josh, died Saturday while working at the family's Rural Lake Preston hog barn, inhaling methane gas. Kingsbury County Sheriff Charles Smith said the two were working in an underground lift station pump pit near a hog lagoon in an attempt to fix a freezing pipe in the pit. Unfortunately, I had the pleasure of watching the family relive and grieve this grieve the father and son's death every year during our achievement days until um, I switched positions in 2011 through an award that they give to recognize those families. So every year I was reminded of how tragic um, these farm accidents are and how quickly they can happen. And in this case, as we mentioned earlier, um, typically or unfortunately, we tend to see more than one person involved in these accidents. So my goal is here at the end of, of the presentation is to hope that you have a better understanding of the risks involved with manure handling, to get proper training available to those in the industry and employees that are involved with handling this manure, to better understand the need for the signage that's out there, and along with that, the safety gear that we should have on hand. In addition to that, how to train people to make that 911 call. What I'd like to do is to challenge each of us to establish a hierarchy of safety within our operations. And this was brought to my attention and I really appreciated it in a publication put together by the University of Wisconsin. Rebecca Larson was the lead on this and it's listed in the resources there entitled Reducing Risk from Manure Storage Agitation Gases. What they did and recommend in this is first I remove if you can the hazards if they're available. That being your gases and any other hazards that may be um, in existence. And then jointly establish safeguards and warnings for the people involved in working with the manure. We also want to go in and train the people that are handling this manure on a daily or periodic basis. And lastly, make sure that we have the personal protective equipment on hand and available to those that are utilizing or working with the manure and make sure that they know how to utilize it correctly. So let's first talk about these hazards. As Jerry mentioned, there are forming gases and he was exposed to hydrogen sulfide. But first I'd like to talk about um, methane and carbon dioxide. These are both gases that we as human beings cannot smell. Um, they tend to displace oxygen and cause death by asphyxiation, okay? Now methane, as you'll note in, in the bar on the left there, it is lighter than air, and that was the gas that unfortunately uh, caused the tragic death of the Odegaard family. They were down there working on those manure pits in um, February, the colder months, and typically when we're agitating and working with manure, if you can have colder temperatures and get that manure down, in temperature, the gases um, are going to be 
less present. It doesn't mean that they won't be there and we still need to follow the precautions. I want to ex express that um, a lot. The other thing to remember with methane is um, it's extremely flammable and explosive. Um, it is odorless, as we mentioned earlier. It tends to rise because of it being lighter than air towards the top of that pit. Um, and it does cause that death by suffocation. Whereas carbon dioxide, that, that's a gas that's heavier than air. Also odorless and it tends to be more at the bottom of the pit. And we hear a lot about these two gases, even in, in homes and whatnot, and both cause death, like we said, by suffocation. We don't see death by carbon dioxide as often, but don't, it can still happen, okay? Um, when we're monitoring the gases present, we wanna make sure that our oxygen level is above 19 and percent. Okay, now when we talk about hydrogen sulfide and ammonia, um, ammonia tends to be the gas that is extremely irritating to the eyes and the respiratory tract. Um, it will cause intense burning through, through your lungs and nasal passages, and in high enough concentrations, it can be fatal, you know. However, when we talk about hydrogen sulfide, it also has a putrid smell to it. it smells like rotten eggs, like Jerry mentioned. Um, but in high enough concentrations, that gas can cause the olfactory senses to paralyze and we, we don't become aware of it anymore. And so as that concentration gets heavier, that's when we tend to have the death start to occur. And it honestly doesn't take an extremely high concentration. In fact, concentrations between a 700 and 1,000 parts per million can cause death, when in minute, cause death within minutes. Um, it is also explosive and heavier than air. So we need to remember the characteristics of these gases and especially keep that in mind as we're looking at sensors and our equipment and we'll talk about that more in just a minute. So let's learn a little bit more about uh, these gases and you'll note in this picture typically we handle manure uh, storage in a couple of, of pretty common methods. It's either going to probably be out in a lagoon or it's gonna be in a deep pit or some fo form of pit under a building. So when we're talking about lagoons, we can, we can still have um, toxic gas exposures. You know, we don't hear of it as often, but when this occurs is typically when we have a temperature inversion. And a temperature inversion is when we have cold air being trapped down at the surface level, that denser, colder air is being held down by the warm air above it. And that causes the gas to have an inability to disperse up into the air. Now we need to remember the other conditions that are often present is when there's less wind, and that's typically when those temperature inversions or there's the hot days um, also holding uh, the gases down to earth due to probably either higher humidity and those and the air temperature. Agitation is typically when those gases start to get released and when we agitate and we need to remember this that um, manure decomposition happens in an anaerobic process. The microbes are in there breaking down the organic matter within the manure and creating typically those four gases we mentioned earlier, the methane, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and ammonia. So even in our lagoon situation, we can have those gases because oftentimes we're creating or having either lagoons that are now covered or have a thick crust over the top of them. So when agitation occurs, that's when those gases are released into the air. And like I said, the toxic exposures uh, increase when we have uh, little to no wind or those temperature inversions happening. And I'm gonna talk about some other um, hazards that can exist with lagoons here in just a second. But let's talk also about the deep pits. Um, as you'll note in the screen here on the slide, um, in the example, you wanna think about where those gases are occurring. Remember we said that, um, the, the methane gas is the gas that typically it's gonna be lighter than air. Ammonia tends to disperse throughout, okay, and we'll smell that. Um, the hydrogen sulfide and the carbon dioxide are the gases that we're gonna find typically down towards the surface of the manure. So if you have to, say, get down in this pit and you're working on an agitation pump that's close in at manure level, um, that's where you're gonna find a lot more of these gases. 
you know, and, you know, as Jerry had mentioned, um, great example there, unfortunate that it happened, but he had to get down in that pit and work on that pump. And that's where those gases were existing, okay? Um, we need to remember when we are in this situation that we make darn sure that we have explosion proof ventilation in place and that that ventilation is not only pumping fresh air in, but also simultaneously pulling the bad air out, okay? And jumping back to the lagoon, the other thing we need to remember is with our lagoons, we can have some other hazards exist also. And that being that oftentimes we have unstable ground. And with that unstable ground, um, we can see sometimes drownings occur. And what happens is not only can they be sucked in with the manure because it's thicker than water oftentimes, and, and, but the drowning also um, gets precipitated by the fact that the person may become incapacitated or have asphyxiation to start to occurring due to the gases at the surface level as they're, they're thrashing around trying to get out of the manure and those gases start get to released and so that asphyxiation can happen. In addition times, the other hazard with our lagoons is that um, they're often in remote locations, um, out behind buildings, those types of places and not there's not a lot of traffic occurring and people typically are not, um, or it's not in a high traffic area. The other thing, unfortunately, that happens too often is these areas often are not fenced in. And so we may have other uh, hazards outside of humans, such as animals that become, um, you know, exposed to this, this lagoon or the hazard area and drowned also in those lagoons. So we need to keep that in mind too. Um, the thing to recommend, and we'll get into safeguards here, but the other hazard I wanted to mention before I forget was back with both of these situations is the equipment that we utilize in the pumping. There can be some hazards there, and you'll see this here in the next slide. Um, we want to make sure that the equipment we have, for example, when we talk about ventilation, that it has the proper safeguards, that it that it is, um, you know, going to be able to be used. Be, in and not be uh, cause an explosion. And the other thing with some of the equipment is that the, the guards on those equipments need to be make sure that they're in place and they're working properly because there's a lot of pinch points involved there. Um, we've got PTO shafts, chains, belly or uh, belts and pulleys, um, ex you know, sometimes existing in these things and, and we can become entangled that way. I might mention also with, uh, Fencing, that's really important to have these safeguards as far as around your lagoons, um, especially around in those areas to keep not only human beings from falling in, but also other uh, animals from falling into those lagoons. In addition to that, make sure that you are util utilizing proper signage on those fences um, and that you're using uh, the, the language, not only in English, but also if you have um, bilingual people work in your operation and maybe ESL or English as a second language is a priority that you have them maybe, for example, posted. Um, we, we have a fair amount of Spanish speaking people um, in Spanish so that they can understand the dangers that are present also. And they need to be placed around the entire perimeter periodically of that lagoon, okay? And lastly, um, make sure that you've got uh, the proper gas sensors available, you know, and there's several different kinds, you know, and we talk about gas sensors. There's optical sensors, which are the ones that um, they'll typically just test one gas. They change color and they're, and they're fairly inexpensive, okay? Um, and util a lot of people may utilize them, say, if they're uh, manure haulers, things like that, you know, and, and just to get an understanding of the gases that are present. Then there's the metal oxide sensors. These are more permanent. Um, they can be accessed from remote locations. Unfortunately, they're fairly expensive and they will monitor either one or several gases at a time, okay? And then you have the electrochemical sensors. Um, these can monitor either a single or multiple gases and they have a fairly quick and rapid response and they're going to vary in price range from depending on if you get a single gas sensor 
at around $150 to a multi-gas anywhere from $250 up to $2,000 I've seen um, for price ranges on, on these sensors. So make sure that um, you're utilizing the, some of these safeguards and, and putting them in place and uh, following through and that they're in good working order in your operations. The other thing I might mention too is we want to make sure that those gas sensors are calibrated on a periodic basis and working properly. Very important. I mentioned the signage um, and this is extremely important especially since we have a variety of people working in our agricultural operations um, and many of them do not understand the dangers that exist when we talk about manure manure handling. You know, we need to not only express to them that, that there is danger, but also identify what that danger is. You know, that there could be drowning, that it could be um, the toxic gases and they may be overcome, or that the, there could be risks for an explosion. So we need to have that signage there to remind them, for example, you know, that there's no smoking in this area, um, that you could be overcome with toxic gases and, and then inform them and talk to them about what those symptoms might be. Um, and also, as far as the dangers, you know, that there could be drowning, you know, if they would uh, happen to slip into these lagoons, for example, or if they would get overcome and drown in, in a pit or whatever in that regards also, not just the toxic gases, okay? Make sure that your signage, as I mentioned previously, um, speaks to the, the uh, personnel that you're employed, take into consideration possibly having um, bilingual signage available there in your operations. Next, as far as that signage, you know, don't be afraid to use colors. Um, you, the universal language is red, uh, expresses danger, and the octagon shape there also along with that in your signage helps convey that message to our people, especially when we're talking uh, multiple languages. You know, the warning and caution typically are done in yellows. Uh, warnings is typically your, your diamond type sign there, and then the caution sign in the triangle, okay? Now, the other thing to go along with that is to have proper signage as far as um, emergency contacts, you know, what the farm name is, what the 911 address is. You know, people should know how to access this and have that available, have it posted not only in your for example, lunchroom, but out probably, for example, if it's a, it's a lagoon, have that posted out there by your lagoon with your other signage um, in these areas or in a, in a manure pit room um, right there so people don't have to go searching for this information if they don't know the address, for example, off the top of their head. Um, that's very, very important. The other thing I might mention here as we get into training is that when we talk about the 911, we need to make sure that our employees are able to do three things when they make a 911 call. They need to be able to provide specific directions. They need to be able to give an accurate description of the accident. And then in addition to that, identify the number of victims involved. Now, when we talk about that accurate description, not only the 911 address needs to fall in the place there, but they need to say, you know, we're at the lagoon. It's in behind the barn so that the emergency management crew or personnel when they get there are able to locate them and locate them quickly, okay? So as we go through this and we talk about training, one of the things I wanna encourage is at a bare minimum, we talk about manure management training on an annual basis, but I'd actually like to even encourage more than that. If you have uh, monthly meetings or you have employee personnel, you know, this probably should be talked about at least monthly. Um, and to remind them or to express to them um, some of the basics here um, and that they're following these protocols. The other thing with that is, is employee turnover happens quite regularly on, in different operations. We need to make sure that the people that are handling the manure or anyone else is receiving you know, that training right away, but especially those that are gonna be um, consistently working with manure, whether it be scrapers, for example, in a dairy barn, or people out there who are uh, doing the pumping. You know, they need to have that training as new employees and then refresher courses, like I said, on a periodic basis. I'd like to say minimum annually, but even monthly 
is very important. Now, the other caveat with this is, you know, when Aaron asks the question off and we should offer the training, the other caveat I'd like to say with this is it depends. Don't be afraid to take the opportunity. If you see someone being complacent or not following the proper standard, standard operating protocols that you've established, make sure that corrective action, you mention it to them and you talk to them about the proper protocols and remind them what they need to be doing because what we do not want to have happen is an accident occurring or a toxic poisoning, okay? Uh, when you're talking to your employees and going through the training, you need to talk to them about the gases that are present and what the symptoms are, what these gases can do to a person, and go through that more or less what I did, like what I did as far as go through those four gases. Um, mention again, give them that 911 address training and communications training on how to get, get a, give a 911 call. And the other thing I got to you know, express to you, everyone is that it's really important that no matter who it is in your operation, they be able to do this and have some basic um, understanding of the 911 calls. And the other thing with it is in our operations, we've got to remember, oftentimes, Farms are located in remote areas, and it's going to take time for people to get there in those emergency management situations, and we're depending upon them to get there quickly. And even on major highways, having witnessed an accident here back in August, it still took well over 10 minutes for people from the emergency management personnel to get there, and the accident occurred literally only about four miles out of a major town on a major highway. So we need to remember, you know, it, they're not going to get there in a split of the second and we need to know what to do if these situations start to occur. In addition to that, training needs to be provided as far as what your safeguards are, um, how to operate that equipment safely, how to operate the harnesses and make sure that they fit and they're able to utilize them properly. They need to know how to calibrate those sensor, sensors. And also, if you're going to make available um, or have in hand that a person is trained and fitted properly for that, the breathing equipment in your operation, okay? So the personal protective equipment going through not only what the dangers are, but also how to utilize that personal protective equipment properly. We also need to remind, as far as our personnel, that all um, manure handling should be done in pairs. Now, there is a caveat to this, and that's what is expressed in the bright red, is that on no instance should that second person ever attempt to go down into that pit to rescue someone. Their job, and I emphasize their job, is to solely be able to call or relay in to 911 for an emergency and to be able to lift that second person out with a harness. And that is the other thing, that person, uh, when you're going through and training your employees or your family members about this, that they need to have the strength and the ability to utilize and that harness and lift that other person out in a situation. Because the last thing we wanna have happen is that a rescue turns into, re into a recovery. Okay, um, as far as that, no one, you know, expressing to them again that no one should enter that manure holding area without proper training. Um, if someone needs to go into that, they need to be equipped with a self-contained breathing apparatus and, know, and having it fit properly and know how to utilize it properly, okay? And typically that's gonna be your people as far as your emergency management personnel. Um, they should also have a, far, a harness on, on them and be equipped with gas sensors and making sure at all times that everyone, uh, when they're working with manure, that proper ventilation is being utilized in these facilities. That's extremely important when we talk about uh, ventilation, whether it's in a barn situation or even if it's just outside with a lagoon, that you know, that we're not out agitating and it's on a really still hot day. Um, those are the types of situations that can get us into trouble.
as we come to a conclusion here, um, just emphasizing again as far as, you know, the personal protective equipment above, we've got our self-contained breathing apparatus, realizing those are quite expensive. Um, also, you know, not every operation is probably going to have one, but if you're a manure hauler or you work, work with manure haulers, they absolutely must have one of these, you know, but making an escape respira respirator available to your personnel um, may be the difference between a life and a death. And, it, and the reason I say that is an escape respirator, what it does is it provides extra oxygen to the person to hopefully get them out of, for example, if they're in a deep pit and get them up and out of there if they're starting to get overcome with gases instead of um, having, you know, a death occur, okay? Uh, make sure that you've got a safety harness. This is some bare minimum equipment here available for your employees, the ones that, you know, or a rope and be able to use that. A rope and a pulley will also work, but a safety harness is better because it helps make the lifting easier. Um, and probably going to cause less harm to the person and have that available and make sure that the person that's on the other end of that rope, again, I emphasize, be able to lift that other person out. Okay, the other thing um, as far as those gas monitors, you know, we go back to the types of gas monitors that we had and looking to those, we want to make sure at a bare minimum um, that they're probably using either an optical or an electrochemical one. And that has to be equipped on the person close, probably up by their collar or somewhere where breathing is taking place. So that can be monitored and they can have some idea as far as, um, you know, if there is a toxic gas present or not, okay? Lastly, when we talk about lagoons, um, I would encourage you on your fence around those lagoons to have um, a floating um, buoy or a, a rescue buoy there to be able to throw out to someone um, tied to a rope so that that person can be pulled back in and not a second person is going to be uh, involved or be a tragedy also, okay? The other things as far as below the line there, we've got safety glosses, uh, reflective vests, you know, um, sometimes that agitation equipment is quite loud. We wanna provide the appropriate ear protection. Gloves abs are an absolute must and proper boots um, is also recommended, be, you know, waterproof boots in these situations. Um, the safety glasses, obviously, you know, manure, uh, we can get flying not only metal, but manure into our eyes and help prevent that exposure. We're dealing oftentimes between the gloves and the eyes, you know, um, with potential for zoonotic d disease transmission. And, and that happens a lot with our manure as those bodily excretions from the animals are excreted. The safety vests help, you know, establish that visibility and help hopefully make the person uh, obviously more visible or if they're they have been passed out or something we can find them a lot quicker. Uh, the footing again the waterproof boots are pretty important there um, in those situations to help provide that traction but also to help provide comfort and not um, have wet feet in those situations causing um, irritation for the person performing these tasks. Just like to summarize again as we go through this and really think about when we're establishing the safety of hierarchy in our operations. Just to remind people first, we want to try to remove that hazard if possible and go ahead then and make establish our safeguards and our warnings to our personnel and our people working in these situations. Make sure that they're getting the proper training and that we're also making the proper personal protective equipment available to those people. So I thank you for listening in and uh, open to any questions.